as plenary on regional order and security on the Indo-Pacific. More than any other region, the Indo-Pacific will shape the trajectory of the 21st century. Nations' fortunes will rise and fall depending on developments there. The Indo-Pacific, as you all know, is the fastest growing region in the world and home to half of the world's population. The U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan with intentions to refocus energies in this region. Last week, Secretary Blinken insisted that notwithstanding the Russia crisis, the United States will remain focused on the Indo-Pacific. Now, this region of growth and promise has seen immense challenges in recent years. Despite what we heard from Foreign Minister Wang Yi this morning, the sovereignty and sovereign rights of many countries in the region are being dis disrespected, not least in the South China Sea. But momentum has been building in response to these challenges, reframing the region to capture the Indian and Pacific Oceans as one strategic theater has been one response. We have also seen a proliferation of minilaterals and strengthening of bilateral ties. The Quad has been revitalized, and today we have all members of the Quad, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States represented on this panel. Two of the four members of the Quad, Australia and the United States, along with the United Kingdom, also recently concluded the AUKUS Security Pact. But it's not just powers from within the region that are increasingly focused on the Indo-Pacific. A significant development in the last few years has been greater involvement by extra-regional powers. As the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific notes, the region's growing economic, demographic and political weight makes it a key player in shaping the rules-based international order and in addressing global challenges. France, Germany and the Netherlands have all issued Indo-Pacific policy documents in the last couple of years. The UK's integrated review included an Indo-Pacific tilt. Now with that, let me now introduce our first speaker. I'm very pleased uh, to call on France's Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, Jean-Yves Le Drion. France was the first European country to adopt its own Indo-Pacific strategy, and it has called the Indo-Pacific region a priority for France. In three days, France will host the Indo-Pacific Forum with representatives from 30 countries, including, as I understand it, Australia and some of the countries here today. Minister Le Drian, may I please invite you to come on and join me on stage. The floor is yours. Merci beaucoup pour cet accueil, mesdames et messieurs, chers amis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for welcoming me here, Lin Kwok. Dear friends, right in the center of our continent, we are currently experiencing a grave crisis, major tensions. But we are also experiencing a moment of decisiveness, of alliance resolve that has always been the strength of the transatlantic alliance. And we see how this is proving to be very valuable yet again. And we are also experiencing a moment where the Europeans are fully living up to their role and doing that in a united and responsible manner as allies um, that are committed to freedom and humanist uh, world view and to peace. And we do know that very well because we get together here year after year in Munich at this conference. I believe it's my eighth time uh, that I'm here. And so we all know that there can be no real sovereignty without solid partnerships for sovereignty. So real partnerships for sovereignty. What does that mean? It means that the Europeans also, as part of the Atlantic Alliance, 
build something comparable in Africa and the Indo-Pacific. You may have noticed that this is at the core of international topics of the current French Council presidency in the European Union. This is the core of the Euro, at the core of the Euro EU AU summit that took place yesterday in Brussels. This is to give new momentum to the EU AU partnership, and that is also going to help the work with the Indo Pacific states, um, where we will have a meeting in Paris with those states next week. So the partners in the regions are to assist us in implementing our guidelines, our strategic guidelines for the region that we set ourselves with our 27 partner nations. Let me be very clear, the Indo-Pacific area is now a priority region for us as Europeans. We do have interests in this region already, and we have ties to the region. We just heard this in the introduction, and I'm not only saying that because France itself is a nation in the Indo-Pacific, but I can only remind you of the fact that more than two million of our people, uh, of the French people, live overseas in countries in this world region. Ninety-three percent of our own ex um, exclusive economic zone is located in the Indo-Pacific. 7,000 service members are permanently deployed to there to protect our space of sovereignty together with other partners. When it comes, for example, to maritime surveillance or maritime assistance measures, we're very proud to be a member of a group of nations in the Indo-Pacific. And we're also very proud of the fact that we're a partner for the development of the ASEAN countries. I think we don't say that often enough, so I have to reiterate it. The European Union is the first and most important donor for this region, the most important investor in this region, and one of the most important trade partners for the Indo-Pacific region. And we work with India, Japan, South Korea, and the ASEAN nations, and we have forged important partnerships with them. And what's decisive is that we work in the fields of strategy, the maritime area, and in demography, and in many others. And so the Indo-Pacific region is home to three-fifths of the world population and 60% of the value creation worldwide. And so we think that we should continue this fight to fight for uh, the rule of law in this region. And we can only do that in an Indo-Pacific that is free and open. This is why we want to offer our partners in the region a path of respectful cooperation that respects their sovereignty and provides them and us with an alternative so that we will not step in the trap of dependence or avoid hegemony or subjugation, etc., and to avoid being all isolated. This is why we are determined to make our model known and our approach known in this region. Our ambitions and our goals are to be pursued in a concrete fashion, and I'm highlighting the word concrete because we have to implement these plans now if we really want to have an impact for the people in the Indo-Pacific and for the future of all of us. We together want to forge a partnership ship that strengthens our sovereignty, and we want to adapt our capabilities to the challenges of the present and the future. For the partner that mean, partners, that means that they we need to help them develop um, the capabilities to produce a vaccine, for example, and we must make sure that partners don't have rules given to them or that other actors have too much influence, and that applies particularly to the prote protection of personal rights. Also, we want to defend the freedom of navigation. That's a fundamental principle 
of international law, and especially the important navigation routes need to be protected. But how and with whom do we do that? And we have to figure out who to talk to. We also want to work together on biodiversity, especially in the sea and the oceans. And so that means that we have want to promote an exchange among students because the youth of today needs to build the world of tomorrow. And so we have to act very specifically and concretely. And we have to be respectful here. And so we will discuss that next Tuesday in Paris at the summit among the EU foreign ministers together with representatives from the Indo-Pacific. I'm also welcoming the colleagues who are already here and will travel to Paris later next week. We will do that in the presence of representatives from important institutions, including the EU. I, I myself am convinced that this is a turning point, a turning point for Europe that will be a guardian of common welfare and well-being. But it will also be important to the partners in the region who, like we, need choices in order to be able to make actual decisions. It's going to be a turning point for international events because this is all not going to follow the logic of, of blocks. And that is what we want to highlight. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Le Drian. I'd now like to invite the other four speakers to join me on stage. We'll be having a moderated discussion for about half the remaining time before turning to questions from the audience. Please. So no one on this panel needs an introduction, but let me just do the rounds anyway. Um, to my right, we have Dr. Subramaniam Jaishankar, Minister of External Affairs of um, India. Uh, next to him, we have Senator Maurice Payne, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Australia. To, uh, a seat from her is uh, Mr. Hayashi Yoshimasa. Welcome, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan. And uh, to the extreme right, uh, Senator Jean Shaheen, a senior member of the US Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and chairwoman of the Senate Subcommittee on Europe and Regional Security Corporation. Welcome to all of you. Minister Jayashankar, if it's all right, I'll begin with you. Uh, we just heard about how um, France and Europe in general are contributing to Indo-Pacific uh, security. But since we are in Europe, I'd like to ask you how India is contributing to European security. India has spoken out uh, vociferously against China um, for its actions on the disputed border between India and China. But India, however, has abstained uh, from voting on Ukraine in the UN Security Council. Could you please help me understand if India's position is that different principles uh, should apply in different parts of the world? Well, um, I don't think the uh, situations in the Indo-Pacific and the uh, transatlantic are really analogous. And certainly uh, the, the uh, assumption in your question that somehow there's a trade-off and you know, one country does this in the Pacific, so in return you do something else. I don't think that's the way uh, international relations work. Uh, we have, I think, uh, quite distinct uh, challenges. Uh, uh, what's happening here, what's happening uh, in the Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, in fact, if there was a connection by that logic, you would have had a lot of European powers very early taking very sharp positions in the Indo-Pacific, and we didn't see that. We haven't seen that since 2009. So now, yes, there is now, from last year, a EU strategy. What you spoke about in your remarks, uh, France, Germany, uh, Netherlands, these are all very recent developments. And the problem in Indo-Pacific is not recent. So, so I, would, I would say uh, you really need to look at that question again. So you uh, disagree that principles, um, the international rules-based order, international law, you disagree that that should apply across the world uniformly? No, I think I, I would say principles and interests are balanced. And if people were so principled in this part of the world, they would have been practicing the principles in Asia or in Afghanistan before they, we've actually seen them do. Let's move on to the next question to uh -huh. you, um, uh, and moving away from Europe now. Uh, India's relations with China took a sharp downturn in, uh, I think it was around June 2020, um, given the Ladakh crisis on your border. What has the crisis m meant for India-China uh, strategy, India's China strategy, and has it meant a decisive and enduring shift towards the West? Uh, it has, look, it's a, uh, it's a problem we are having with China. And the problem is this, that for uh, 45 years, there was uh, peace, uh, there was uh, uh, stable border management. Uh, there were no military casualties on the border from 1975. That changed uh, because we had uh, agreements with China not to bring uh, military forces to the, no, I mean, we call it border, but it's line of actual control. Uh, and the Chinese violated those uh, agreements. Now, uh, the state of the border uh, will determine the state of the relationship. That's natural. So obviously, uh, uh, relations with China right now are going through a very difficult phase. Uh, but uh, I would uh, uh, quite honestly again uh, question your question that therefore our relations with the West are better. My relations with the West were quite decent before June 2020. So again, I would challenge that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, correlation that you're making. But of course, we've seen India step up in the quad. We've seen um, India seek to strengthen relations, uh, bilateral relations with Australia and further. You made your first visit uh, to Australia as external affairs minister. I think it was just last week when uh, Minister Payne hosted uh, you. So I, I, I think we have seen, in fact, uh, a strengthening of uh, India's relations, perhaps with some countries in the quad at the very least, even if it might not mean enduring strengthening of ties with um, with uh, the West? Well, you know, this, uh, uh, this incarnation of the Quad started in 2017. Mm -hmm. I participated in the first meeting when I was Foreign Secretary, uh, like the Permanent Undersecretary. So it's not a post-2020 development. Yeah. Our relations with the Quad partners, the United States, Japan, Australia, have steadily improved in the last 20 years. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, again, as I said, you're making it seem like cause and effect. Right. I would challenge that. Okay. I, I think the Quad has a uh, value in itself. Uh, it's four countries who recognize today that the world would be a better place if they cooperated. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what's happening. Thank you. Um, perhaps just one more question um, on, on um, India and Southeast Asia. Um, Prime Minister Modi has um, a look East, uh, enact East policy. Um, he's sought to focus um, more on Southeast Asia. Uh, however, a recent poll, um, in fact, I think it was published just last week, uh, indicates that um, on this occasion of 30th, the 30th anniversary of ASEAN India relations, which we celebrate this year, on, at this time, um, levels of trust between Southeast Asian countries and India are fairly low. Um, India ranks uh, fifth after Japan, the United States, the EU, China, and only 16.6% .6 of respondents in this poll um, have said that they have confidence in India. What do you think India can do better to leverage its great soft power in the region? 
I'm a politician, so I believe in polls, but I've never seen a poll which has made any sense to me when it comes to foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So I guess the one you cited probably is part of a long list there. But uh, I would say that uh, uh, our relations right now with the ASEAN are actually uh, growing well. Uh, we, I mean, if I were to actually look at the evolution, the two big changes which are taking place, uh, we have much stronger security cooperation uh, with uh, ASEAN. I've just come from a trip to the Philippines where we've actually signed uh, agreements for, uh, for military supplies to the Philippines. Uh, we have strong, we are part of ADMM Plus, we have strong bilateral uh, relations with Singapore, Indonesia, uh, and uh, Vietnam, amongst others. Uh, so, uh, and the other is con physical connectivity. So, so uh, I hate to challenge you for the fourth time, but I don't think that poll's very good. Challenge away, please. Uh, uh, Minister Payne, let me come to you, and hopefully it'll be less contentious. Um, you have, um, Australia has sought to strengthen both minilateral as well as bilateral security relations um, in response to what your minister has described at the launch of your 2020 defense strategic update as a post-COVID world that is poorer, more dangerous, and more disorderly. Um, I think that security environment has deteriorated ever since Australia's 2017 foreign policy white paper. What are some of the key changes that you've seen um, since Australia's 2017 white paper? I can probably um, also uh, respond to your question since Australia's uh, 2016 defence white paper, which is a good catch. There's a cricket team in the world that could do with that. Um, since Australia's 2016 defence white paper, which uh, I was also responsible for, uh, for producing. But I think um, we're clearly in an era of growing uh, and uh, pervasive strategic competition. And it is important for those of us who uh, want to prosecute the case for uh, the rules-based global order, for uh, the rule of law, for human rights, for the values that underpin uh, our liberal democracies to engage actively in that strategic competition. And Australia does that uh, across a very broad canvas. We do that, um, and I reflect on, uh, on my friend uh, Jay's response to your last question. We do that with uh, the enhancement and the development of our key bilateral relationships. Australia and India signed a comprehensive strategic partnership um, in 2020, right at the beginning of some of the greatest challenges of the COVID pandemic. I think it was Prime Minister Modi's first virtual undertaking uh, in, uh, in COVID, and um, happily we're here in person because we're all zoomed out. Australia and Japan have just signed a reciprocal access agreement which will uh, transform and enhance the way we're able to uh, engage particularly uh, between the Japanese Self-Defence Force and uh, the Australian uh, Defence Force. Australia and the United States have just marked the 70th anniversary of the signing of the ANZUS Treaty uh, which reinforces the, uh, the now uh, well-known phrase that uh, we enjoy as a foundation of the Alliance 100 years of, uh, of mateship. Uh, that's a bilateral scan but uh, in terms of minilaterals, uh, you've referred and spoken with uh, Dr. Jashankar about, uh, about the Quad. And when I think about how the Quad has transformed from the first in-person foreign ministers meeting, uh, which Dr. Jashankar and I were both participants uh, in, in New York on the sidelines of Unger in uh, September of 2019, to an in-person Quad Leaders Summit in 2021, notwithstanding the extraordinary exigencies of COVID-19 and what that has, uh, what has wrought upon the world. When I think about an in-person Quad Leaders Summit and being able to come to that point uh, together as liberal democracies, and then when I think about the fact that um, the four of us, uh, all four, foreign minister and foreign minister equivalents were able to meet in Australia in Melbourne just uh, 10 days ago. Uh, that says to me that the value of uh, less um, uh, traditional groupings uh, at a time of great strategic competition is immensely important. It also says to me that where we do have traditional groupings, whether it's uh, through the G7 and the plus aspect of the G7, in which India and uh, Australia have both participated uh, during the chair of, uh, of the United Kingdom and, uh, and France, 
uh, the G7, the G20, which this year is led by Indonesia, um, the world's most populous Muslim nation in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's a very powerful message to see the G20 being uh, led by India and what we're able to do uh, through that. And then for Australia, our engagement with ASEAN, which for us is at the centre of the Indo-Pacific and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific and its principles uh, are uh, very much uh, in accord with our own view of, a, of an Indo-Pacific that is secure, that is stable, that is prosperous, that is free from coercion uh, and that encourages the growth of the sorts of relationships uh, that I've talked about. And as well as ASEAN for us, the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, this is, this is uh, an important uh, part of, uh, of our strategic uh, and family engagement, as Australia so often refers to, uh, to the Pacific, where priorities are different. Where priorities right now are health security uh, and the extraordinary impact of COVID-19 on countries of small populations uh, which are, are economically challenged by uh, lockdowns and, uh, and closures of countries through COVID. Uh, so health security, economic security, climate change uh, and the work that we do with them is absolutely focused on climate adaptation and, uh, and climate resilience. Uh, so they're some of the things that, uh, that we have uh, pursued in the uh, last few years, uh, both since uh, the uh, 2016 Defence White Paper and the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, which, uh, which reflect the very significant changes we're seeing in the region. Thank you. And of course, um, Australia has also entered into the AUKUS deal uh, with um, the United States and, and uh, and, um, and the UK. Um, there have, I mean, the, the deal has largely been welcome, including by many countries in the region, uh, but critics of the deal have also argued that it will lead to an arms race and that it will lead to uh, China and Russia seeking to double down on their naval partnership uh, without significantly uh, contributing to Australia, the region's security in the next 20 years, which is the length of time it takes. Um, it's estimated that the, the submarines will take to be built. Um, what would your response to these critics be? Respectfully, I would say that um, any suggestion that uh, Australia's acquisition of nuclear powered, powered uh, submarines uh, and uh, our engagement with our great and traditional allies and partners, the United States and the United Kingdom, are on uh, issues like quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and cyber. Any suggestion that that's going to contribute to uh, an arms race, given Australia's record in non-proliferation, uh, our absolute focus and commitment on uh, ensuring that uh, we continue to maintain that first-class record uh, is uh, fanciful or potentially ridiculous. Uh, and I would also say that uh, as a country which uh, focuses very strongly on addressing disinformation and misinformation wherever we see it, uh, that uh, we would call out uh, those sorts of, uh, of statements as misinformation and disinformation. We would shine light on those and we would expose people and countries who are making those sorts of statements. I understand, though, that um, given the uh, consequence of such an important decision, that the work that we are doing with our friends and partners in ASEAN, uh, within the Pacific, particularly on the issues of non-proliferation, is essential. And that's why I'm pleased to line up Australia's record on non-proliferation, Australia's engagement with the IAEA uh, against um, anyone who would uh, seek to suggest that uh, we're contributing to an arms race. Um, you mentioned climate change earlier, and of course also your greater engagement, um, intensified engagement with the Pacific. Um, so Australia has the Pacific Step Up Program, and um, these countries in the Pacific have actually identified climate change as the single greatest threat to the Pacific. How good a job do you think your government has done in helping Pacific Island countries mitigate uh, the threat of tr climate change? And in this respect, um, I'd like to highlight um, for you to address um, how Australia reportedly blocked Pacific Island leaders from agreeing on a joint declaration to tackle climate change and phase out coal, and how um, Australia last year uh, received the lowest score awarded to any of the 193 members of the United Nations for the level of climate action. And this is according to um, 
uh, a sustainable development report that uh, produced the UN-backed Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So our engagement um, with the, the Pacific um, is constant and uh, has been particularly enhanced uh, in the context of response to, to COVID-19. Uh, that includes uh, our support for uh, health security and, uh, and vaccine uh, delivery in particular, but also uh, COVID economic recovery, whether that is in budget support uh, or in, uh, in other ways. But they are all contributions uh, which we've made across the Pacific in um, particularly the past uh, two years. But our focus is very much as a member of the Pacific Island Forum, an equal member of the Pacific Island Forum with the 17 other nations uh, and who make up the, uh, the forum itself. And whether it is in working uh, on infrastructure with, uh, with our partners through the Australia Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, uh, all of the work that we do through the uh, AIFFP uh, is ensuring that infrastructure development uh, doesn't uh, add, for example, to uh, unaffordable debt loads for uh, partners in the Pacific, that it is focused on their priorities, uh, not the priority of another country that may assert that this is what a country in the Pacific wants, uh, that it is focused on being climate adapted uh, and climate resilient in water, in energy, uh, in uh, transport uh, and in telecommunications. And so that's seen in the last few years uh, the development of uh, submarine cables, for example, uh, for which Australia has delivered between Honiara in the Solomon Islands uh, and the Australian mainland, uh, and similarly between Port Moresby and the Australian mainland, the Coral Sea Cable. The Trilateral Infrastructure partner Partnership, which uh, my friends in the United States uh, and Japan uh, and I uh, support strongly across the region, has uh, most recently delivered um, the Palau Spur Cable uh, and uh, has now most recently agreed on the East Micronesia Submarine Cable, which will enhance the connectivity uh, of countries like Kiribati, uh, of Nauru uh, and um, of the Republic uh, of the Federated States of, uh, of Micronesia. Transformative infrastructure that enhances the operation of health systems and education systems. And, and then the work that we've done within our own country, particularly on emissions reduction, uh, which has, for example, between 2005 and 2020, uh, seen emissions reduced uh, in Australia by almost um, 21%, uh, which is double the OECD average. Uh, on that part and also the fact uh, that we know that uh, the, uh, the projections in relation to our, uh, our Paris commitments will see us uh, exceed our 26 to 28 percent uh, commitment to emissions reduction by reaching 35 percent by 2030 uh, is an important part of Australia's record as well. And we do think there's a difference between targets and achievements. In Australia's case, they're achievements and we're delivering. Thank you very much, Minister Payne. Um, Mr. Hayashi, could I now move to you? Um, for those of you who do not know, I just learnt, that, um, learnt from Minister Payne that Mr. Ha Minister Hayashi sings very well. So perhaps um, after this session, uh, we might get him to sing a note or two. Um, but before that, Minister, could I please ask you um, about how... Um, so in Southeast Asia, we often hear about how US-China rivalry is putting um, many of the countries there in the Bind, and I understand that in Japan as well, um, US-China rivalry is also uh, putting uh, Japan in a bit of a pickle, given that you know it relies on the United States for security, but is greatly um, uh, uh, connected to the Chinese economy as well. But I'd like to hear um, how um, China's um, actions in the region, um, particularly in the East China Sea, for instance, but also its actions um, uh, further afield from that, are uh, catalyzing uh, Japan's security policy um, and what changes we might expect to see um, in Japan's security policy. Thank you. And uh, 
about uh, uh, our foreign policy letting vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, since uh, the, our bilateral relationship is really uh, important, not only for the two countries, but also uh, for the peace and prosperity of the, all the areas and, uh, in, in, in the Pacific. So uh, we are trying to uh, build a constructive and a stable relationship with China uh, by uh, maintaining uh, and messaging our position. So when we should say the things to China, we really say to them. Don't hesitate to uh, send a message vocally and also uh, uh, strongly uh, requesting China uh, responsible uh, activities as a stakeholder in these uh, areas. So, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, cooperating on matters of the common interest. For, for example, the uh, for uh, uh, environment issues, such as uh, uh, Mali is talking about. Those issues we can cooperate with them, but uh, security issues, um, other issues, we have to really speak out. That you, if you should obey the rules, we can go together. But uh, if you don't, maybe we should stand here so that you have to uh, think about that. So those are the really different balance between those two. But uh, uh, so, for, for example, together with the environment issues vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, the U.S. and Japan, and need a cooperation with China because we started to have a six-party talk, and uh, including uh, Japan, U.S., China, and Russia. But uh, now, uh, you know, we have a great concern uh, in the Ukraine issues, so a six-party talk now is not possible, but uh, still, the vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, we have to cooperate with the uh, China in to, to some extent. But for those issues such as uh, Taiwan, and those issues such as uh, uh, the high-tech technologies like AI, quantum, and uh, biotechnologies and other things, uh, we should compete. So uh, we are in the same boat, like with U.S. and like-minded countries on the basis of democracy and uh, values such as the human rights. And those things has to be on the base of uh, doing any kind of uh, interaction with China. So we as United, we have a kind of war here so, and war has to be very strong, and they have to succumb in the wars in, 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 a, in a sense that, that they shouldn't break these big walls united here, which is built by the, the common universal values such as the democracies. So I think, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, the, it, we are now under the severe situation in Ukraine, but Ukraine issues is not only the European issues, but it has a great meaning to the other areas in, in the Pacific too. So, yeah, that's my thought, yeah. You mentioned the need to speak out on security issues, um, and you also mentioned Taiwan. Uh, recently, we have seen a series of high-level pronouncements um, from Japan about Taiwan. So, uh, your defense minister linked Taiwan's security with that of Japan's. Your defense, uh, this was in June 2021, your deputy defense minister was reported as saying that Japan has to, provide, uh, to protect Taiwan as a democratic country. Uh, th that was in July 2021 as well. Um, and in December, I think your former, uh, the former Japanese Prime Minister Abe said that Japan and the United States could not stand by if China attacked Taiwan. Um, I also understand that the US and Japan have um, drawn up plans for a Taiwan con uh, emergency. 
Uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese government has never made an explicit commitment to defend Taiwan or to assist any US military response in the event that China attacks Taiwan. Has Japan's official position on Taiwan changed in light of these statements? Hmm. Yeah, regarding the relationship between the China and Taiwan, the, while the two have a deep ties, especially in the economic field, the overall military balance is tilting towards China's uh, favor, and the gap appears to be uh, growing year by year. So uh, that even in such situations, our position has remained rather unchanged. So Taiwan is a very important partner and friend for Japan. So we share fundamental values and enjoy close economic relations and people-to-people -people exchange. So we will further deepen cooperation and exchange with Taiwan based on our basic position. And the peace and stability uh, of uh, the Taiwan Strait is important not only for Japan's security, but also for the stability of the international community. So our consistent position has been that we expect that the issues surrounding Taiwan will be resolved peacefully by a dialogue. And uh, we will continue to adhere to this position. Thank you very much, Minister Hayashi. Uh, turning now to you, Senator uh, Shaheen. Um, a week ago, the Biden administration issued its Indo-Pacific strategy, um, setting out an affirmative vision for the region. And in that strategy, it reiterates the US plan to launch um, an Indo-Pacific economic framework. Um, We've seen China intensify its trade ties with the region for decades now. It launched its uh, Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. Um, with uh, the United States waking up to the China threat, um, is it a little bit too little too late to be now talking about planning um, an economic framework, especially given if we keep in mind the fact that um, the Biden administration's um, foreign policy for the middle classes essentially has been interpreted to preclude any uh, traditional trade deals which the region desires. So is this going to be enough uh, to sustain US influence in the region? Well, better late than never. You know, I, I thought it was a mistake to pull out of the TPP. Um, the previous, the Obama administration negotiated, and unfortunately, that never got assigned. But the fact is, trade is a very important part. And, you know, the United States is a Pacific nation. We, we forget, maybe, when we're here, because the focus has been so much on Europe. But we're also a Pacific nation. And as Admiral John Aquilino said, He's the head of our Indo-Pacific Command for our military. He said, you know, when, when the United States is not present, we leave the playing field to China. And I know that everyone here who's represented on this panel, we would like our countries to work with China. But we've got to be realistic about what's happening. And anybody who thinks that AUKUS is going to lead to an arms race in the Pacific hasn't been paying attention. There is already an arms race going on. And if you've seen um, the hypersonic weapon that China um, delivered to us not too long ago, um, if you're looking at what North Korea is doing with their missile buildup, it's very clear that we've got to do a better job as democracies of addressing what's happening. And you know, it's not just about military weapons. Um, there is an economic race that's going on as well. And we know from, and lest you think it's just the United States, um, the fact is she and China have said that they intend to provide an alternative to democracy. It's authoritarianism, and they are devoting a huge amount of resources to doing that. So not only are they developing militarily, but they have a huge diplomatic and economic initiative. And when you look at, at maps of where China's influence is, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or their efforts to support um, other economic projects, it spans from the Indo-Pacific 
to Africa to Europe. And we need to wake up to that. They're spending more on their diplomatic activities than the United States is. We've got to do something about that. And we've got to think about it as the democracies who are trying to present an alternative. Obviously, we need to work together in areas that are important to all of us. But we need to do it with eyes wide open. And that's part of what this Pacific strategy is about. It's recognizing that we have a very important role, the United States, to play in the Indo-Pacific. And we need to work with our allies to do that. You've mentioned several times, and I've heard it mentioned um, at the Munich Security Conference um, over several sessions as well, this uh, framing of uh, the contest between the United States and China or the US and its allies and partners um, on the one hand and China on the other hand um, as a contest between authoritarian states and democracies. Um, I wonder, however, and I, of course I understand why that's a good framing um, here in Europe especially, and it's a good framing as well um, when it's targeted at um, garnering greater domestic support with the United States for actions that the United States may take um, that may cost perhaps the populace um, somewhat. But in parts of the Indo-Pacific, um, in many parts of the Indo-Pacific, countries are either not liberal democracies or backsliding democracies. And I wonder whether that's the best possible framing for that part of the world when you're trying to win friends and uh, partners um, when you know your um, Indo-Pacific strategy actually identifies countries like Vietnam, Singapore um, as important partners, Philippines and Thailand as important allies, is that the best framing, authoritarian states versus democracies, um, to win friends and influence in the region? Well, I would point out that wasn't our framing. That's the framing that we're hearing from China, and now Russia is part of that as well. We saw the first for the first time when Putin went to China that they signed their agreement and they said they both opposed the expansion of NATO. And, you know, make no mistake, as we're looking at this crisis in Ukraine, China is looking at the crisis in Ukraine. North Korea is looking at the crisis in Ukraine. Iran is looking at the crisis in Ukraine. All of those countries who are potential, who are adversaries of democracies of the West are going to watch and see what happens to Vladimir Putin. If nothing happens to him, if he invades Ukraine and he takes a country and he decides for that country what their future should be, then there's impunity for anybody else who might want to do the same thing. So this is a, a really important moment. And again, I think, I think we need to work with China and the Indo-Pacific on the arms race, I think it's unfortunate that we're seeing a rise in nuclear weapons in the world. But we need to recognize that in order to do that, we're better off if we're working cooperatively and if we're clear about what the alternatives are. And for those countries who have, um, who have made a deal with China for projects for infrastructure projects, who have taken loans, who see Chinese workers going into their countries to build those projects, who then are indebted to China for what happens. Um, I think framing this as an alternative between, do you want um, a democracy, do you want to work in the global international community where, you know, we would like to provide um, funding through the IMF or the World Bank for projects and, you know, if you take that money, you can not only employ your own people, but then you're not um, in, a, in a deal that is then going to come back in the form of blackmail for what you can do in the future. So uh, I do think it's important for us to be clear about what the alternatives are. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you a question drawing on your um, uh, role as uh, the chairwoman of the Senate Com Subcommittee on Europe and Regional Security Cooperation, if I may. Um, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy states that the U.S., like France, um, recognizes the strategic value of an increasing regional role for the European Union. Um, what role does the United States envisage uh, for the European Union, and will this role be predominantly in the security or the economic realm? 
I, I think it needs to be both. You know, we, we are no longer in a world where the United States can be isolated because we have oceans on both sides, where Europe doesn't have to worry about what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, where Africa is isolated from Europe and from Asia. This is a global world that we're living in. It's a global economy. It's global in terms of um, the actions that are going on. And so the more we can work together, the more we can find areas of agreement, the better. And one of the things that we haven't even touched on at all is cyber and space. The previous panel, if anybody heard them talking about, that's, you know, that's going to be the future of warfare, unfortunately. I, I would hope that we could agree at some point that um, space should not be weaponized, but we're already seeing that happen. Um, we're already seeing that we need to cooperate more in cleaning up our oceans and what's going to happen there. So um, I think this is about recognizing where our mutual interests exist and thinking about how we can work together in support of those mutual interests. Thank you so much. Um, we will now be turning to the question and answer uh, segment of this plenary. Uh, I understand that do those joining us might uh, are able to virtually type out your question and um, in the conference platform uh, from which I will be able to read. However, I do not have a device for that. So if I could be given a uh, device for that, that would be much appreciated. Um, and if I could ask those asking a question to please identify yourself and state your affiliation. Uh, the first question will be going to Munich Young Leader, Richard Hedarian, who's seated in the second row. Uh, he's prof uh, professorial chairholder in geopolitics at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Richard, please. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard Hedarian. It's good to still be considered as young and be back here in Munich. Um, the first informal meeting of Quad, I think, was in Manila, and it was a decade later that the leaders of Quad, actually, again in Manila, came to meet each other. Uh, recently, we had a presidential debate in the Philippines, and it seems even our presidential candidates don't know what is the Quad all about. Can you tell us about Quad? What is it? Is it the Asian NATO? Is it a NATO with Asian characteristics? Is it just an ad hoc body? Uh, and to what degree does the evolution of Quad, maybe in the next 10 years, tethered to behavior of China? And by that matter, also calculus of India, because we have three treaty allies here, India is not. So I think to what degree does China and India's calculus play into the trajectory of Quad in the next decade or so? Thank you very much. I assume that's at me, right? Uh, look, you know, the, the first time the Quad countries came together was actually in 2004. Uh, for the, in response to the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, and uh, I had an association with it. I was the country coordinator, in a sense, for India for that uh, response. Then their representatives met in 2007, as you said, in Manila. But the countries were not sufficiently invested in it politically, so they kind of let it fritter away. And uh, then they met again a decade later. Uh, in 2017, in September, uh, this time at a higher level uh, of a sort of permanent secretary, uh, vice minister sort of level. 2019, it became ministers, which was when we first met. Uh, and 2021, it's become a summit. Now, what is the quad about? You know, it's in a sense natural because partly you're sitting in Europe, but also because uh, uh, all of us pull out concepts from uh, pre-existing lexicon to say it's an Asian NATO because it's, it's a very convenient if completely misleading term but it's still very convenient uh, and of course there are interested parties uh, who advance that kind of analogy. I would put it to you as four countries who have common uh, interests, common values, a great deal of comfort who happen, by the way, to be located at four corners of the Indo-Pacific, who found out that in this world, no country, not even the United States today, has the ability to address big global challenges all on their own. So if you look right now, and you know, my prime minister used this phrase, quad is a force for global good. What's the quad doing? The quad's trying to uh, supply a billion vaccines, which are uh, American IPR produced in India 
uh, funded and uh, logistically supported by Japan and Australia, as well as the two of us. Uh, it's working on uh, ensuring more reliable supply chains. It's looking at critical emerging technologies, making sure that 5G, 6G, those domains are trusted and transparent. Uh, looking at uh, promoting education, at maritime uh, security, uh, at uh, ensuring that connectivity, uh, connectivity projects are ma market-based, viable. Uh, so there is a, there is a, a lot of the global element uh, to what the Quad is doing. Now, obviously, if there are challenges to global norms, global order, to international law, to rules-based order, it makes sense that you know anybody who's working for the good will also look at challenges to the good. Uh, so I would urge you not to slip into that, uh, I mean, forgive my saying so, that lazy analogy of uh, Asian NATO. It isn't, because uh, there are three countries who are treaty allies. We are not a treaty ally. Uh, what doesn't have uh, a treaty, it doesn't have a structure, it doesn't have a secretariat. It's a kind of 20, you know, this is a 21st century way of responding uh, to a more di diversified, dispersed world. Sorry for a long answer, but I thought it's a good explanation. Thank you. Did anyone else have anything to add to that? I think that was an excellent answer. <laughs> so you let, let me say just a few things, because Jay already mentioned about uh, practicality of the Quad. We don't have any treaty, we don't have any framework, but like-minded country of four of us uh, joined and talked, and already we came up with a project such as a vaccine, and further, we, we just met last week, actually, in the leadership of Malaysia, so that uh, we further advance our cooperations uh, in a wide range, uh, like climate change, infrastructure, and uh, especially I really would like to see the critical uh, technologies such as quantum, uh, biotech, and in, in the area of uh, economic state cloud, so that uh, like-minded countries shared value is the key of the quad, I think. Do we have any questions from the floor? Please, sir. Please identify yourself and also state to whom your question is addressed. My name is Reinhard Bütikofer, member of the European Parliament. And my question goes to um, several of the panelists. Minister Payne has explicitly mentioned Australia's connectivity guided infrastructure investment policy. Also, the BRI has been mentioned several times. My question is to the other panelists. What would you make of the um, option of creating a network of trusted connectivity initiatives? And how would you judge in that context the potential of Europe's Global Gateway Initiative? Who would like to take a stab at that question? And perhaps I'll throw one in as well. Um, the global gateway, the Build Back Better World, um, and then earlier we had the Trilateral Partnership for Infrastructure Investment. We've had many initiatives on infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure to what extent we've had progress in that respect, perhaps we could address you know, these various initiatives, including the global gateway as well and its potential. I don't know enough about the Global Gateway to be able to speak to that, um, but I do think the interconnectivity is something that's very important. Also, we make undersea cable in New Hampshire, which is where the state that I represent, so I would love to do something that would promote um, more connectivity undersea. I think that's very important. But you know, I worked on the infrastructure package that we just passed in the United States to try, and a significant piece of that was to try and connect um, a lot of the United States, particularly rural areas, to the internet. Because unless we do that, we rob people of the future of jobs and what's happening 
and prosperity in the world. And so the more we can provide secure interconnections, I think the better for everybody because with the advancement of technology, with um, artificial intelligence, with everything that's going on in the world, if, if people don't have access to the internet, if they aren't interconnected, then they're not gonna have opportunities in the future. So we've gotta make sure that everybody has that opportunity. Minister Payne? I would um, add to that and, uh, and I agree with the, the Senator in terms of uh, the priority that we need to, uh, to place on this, but the size of the, uh, of the need is such that uh, the Global Gateway uh, Initiative, uh, what Australia does, what the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership does, um, and, and Jay will speak for himself, but what India is interested in pursuing, and Secretary Truss, uh, I, was, uh, I think, was uh, on the platform earlier. Uh, the UK is also looking at infrastructure investment uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. We can welcome all comers. It's, it's a demand that uh, certainly welcomes uh, as much contribution as those who are willing to commit to uh, infrastructure investment uh, that is in the interests of the countries uh, in which it is being made that meets their priorities and their needs that doesn't add to the debt burden and that is delivered in a transparent and open way, delivers jobs and investment within the, those countries uh, to, Senator, to the Senator's earlier point, uh, then we should, uh, we should encourage that. And Australia certainly does and uh, we look for partners regularly uh, with uh, with whom to engage there is a an electrification partnership um, development underway in Papua New Guinea now uh, and that partnership uh, includes uh, of course Papua New Guinea but New Zealand uh, as well as uh, Australia the United States uh, and uh, and Japan uh, it will transform the um, access to electricity from give or take 13% in, in homes, in domestic homes, from 13% of the Papua New Guinea population to about 70%. Uh, and these are important investments that are transformative uh, for the countries in which uh, partners are able to engage. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, at, uh, at the size of the demand, I think estimated by the Asia Development Bank at about $48 billion between now and 2030, um, I would say the more the better. Mr. Jayashankar. Uh, you know, in 2016, we were, I think, among the first or probably the first country who actually uh, laid out uh, in detail uh, our, our connectivity policy. And we did so because we could see there was a building debate about strategic connectivity, how to use connectivity for strategic purposes. Uh, now, uh, Essentially what we uh, suggested was that connectivity should be transparent, it should be commercially based, it should have local buy-ins, it should not create debt, it should be environmentally and ecologically friendly, uh, it should not be unilateral, and it should not violate the uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries. It should not be built unilaterally by other countries uh, uh, violating, violating that. Now, uh, since then, I think in the last six years, the world has woken up uh, to the uh, concerns about connectivity, the fact that often connectivity initiatives have hidden agendas or not so hidden agendas, uh, that there's dual purpose connectivity. Uh, and uh, I, I think to e even as quad partners today, each one of us in a sense has a connectivity uh, initiative as indeed does the EU. And if connectivity initiatives are based on similar outlooks, like in any other, uh, like say in vaccine policy, uh, it's natural that you would congregate, that you would synergize, that you would see how does it work for each other. So we would certainly encourage, uh, you know, uh, countries whose connectivity principles and policies are similar. And I can tell you, I would today, I've, I've spent some time discussing with the German development minister how we can uh, work our development policies much closer. It's a conversation we've had with the Japanese, with the Americans, uh, with the Australians, within Quad, but a lot of them bilateral as well. And I think this is going to be among the big issues in international relations in the coming decades. 
Um, Let me uh, add oh, simply one, one thing is about, like Senator mentioned that the first questions I think it's the competition between two systems, like authoritarian systems or a free and democratic systems. And if we are competing, we have to come up with the choice for those countries who need to develop their infrastructures. So how we offer is based on the international rules already established, but other options from other side is sometimes not obeying to those rules already we established. So it's a kind of handicapped uh, competition we are, you know, libeling with the other side. So that's why we need this cooperation between these allies and like-minded countries. And like Malay's case, the, the micro, that's micronesia, the, the island countries, Cebu ones, is, you know, before we leach, that's uh, uh, leached by the China. So uh, rather than just taking their offers, we offer jointly to those countries. And it's a, a case of a very, very uh, successful cases. So that's, that's the, what we are trying to do with Quad and other cases. So uh, uh, the, 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 the gate things you mentioned is uh, we can cooperate with those, uh, those uh, initiatives and other initiatives together uh, in our side. So. Just one follow-up question, and then perhaps a lady in uh, red um, in the second row. Um, Minister Hayashi, um, Japan has, and this might be a little bit of an outdated statistic, but in a 2019 study, um, it found that Japan far outstripped um, China, um, at least in 2019, on infrastructure development in the region, but we hear less about Japan in a sense. I mean, we only gradually started hearing more about Japan's contributions to infrastructure and connectivity development in the region. Why is that so, and is this something that Japan would like to have a higher profile in, or is that part of uh, Japan's economic statecraft to kind of quietly uh, engage with the region um, in helping them develop their infrastructure and connectivity? Maybe we are too shy to uh, announcement of what we are doing. It could be it's a Japanese Kellax risks, maybe. Uh, not in my uh, generations, I hope, but uh, uh, economic state cleft is sometimes not, uh, it's very difficult to do in louder manners because if you speaking out of economic state cleft louder and the lose here, we, we said, then the other side will succumb to all those rules. So uh, harmonization of the economic state cleft and for, for example, such as a secret uh, 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 patent systems like that, uh, we rather choose to be kind of calm way or silent way so that we can harmonize better. Thank you very much. Um, and please, you've been very patient. Um, the lady in the second row. Thank you. Um, I'm Laura von Daniels from the SWP think tank in Berlin. I'm also a Munich Young leader this year. Um, and I wanted to come back um, to some of the things that have been mentioned on the stage about Quad being a group um, of country, countries with common interests and values. And you also mentioned vaccination initiatives. So I wanted to ask, um, do you have a common position on trips waivers or dropping patent rights and I, I suppose if you do it's probably opposed to the European Union's position at this stage so can you also show that you are an effective group of countries by finding common ground with the European Union and that way perhaps also showing that two of the major democratically uh, ruled regions of the world can cooperate on the key question of mankind at this point in time. I'm going to let them respond for their countries. In the United States, we can't even agree in our own country about what the policy should be with respect to vaccinations. So um, I, I think it would be wonderful if we could get a global policy. Um, the World Health Organization, but 
Um, we don't, unfortunately. And so I think what, what we have to do in the United States is to figure out what we can do to try and address our own population and then be as supportive as possible of making sure that vaccine gets to as many countries as we can and support those efforts. Let me add just one point as uh, I uh, experienced as a former agriculture minister about TPP negotiation and finally it's not agriculture issues that uh, we have to deal but finally that's a uh, uh, kind of quasi uh, intellectual property rights for the bio uh, medicines so finally that's uh, made uh, some uh, uh, agreement between US and other sides so it's always the balance between how you can enhance the development of those you know uh, medical equipment or vaccines or whatever because somebody has to spend a lot of money to develop that so that uh, as strong as they are private companies they have to assure that their investment be fully kind of paid back after they sell the things so uh, that's the difficulty but uh, so so like pandemic situation like this we have to be very creative about uh, how to you know still by still keep keeping a balance between those two uh, how we can uh, set through these uh, uh, difficult questions the gentleman in the fourth row please yes I have a simple I, question. This is Abdul Moment for Foreign Minister of Bangladesh. <laughs> and I'm so pleased to see the great friends around here. I have a hypothetical question. The question is, in many countries in the, you know, the ocean, in this Indian, India specific, they're becoming, uh, you know, this uh, economic upliftment. A country like Bangladesh, for example, we are doing pretty well in terms of economic development. Since we are doing pretty well, as a result, the aspirations of our common people has gone up, shoot up. They want more facilities, more opportunities for a better life, and more infrastructure facilities in the country. But we don't have money, neither do we have technology. So in that case, we have a difficulty. We need to develop to face this public demand, the challenge. But at the same time, you know, this uh, help from many countries has been declining. Uh, thanks to, of course, Japan, they are our, one of the best friends who have been investing in our infrastructure. And also thanks to India, they have been giving line of credit to us. But uh, alternatively, the ch China comes forward with a basket of money and aggressive proposals, affordable proposals. And then you have a problem, what to do? We would expect, because as the development process is ongoing, our people demand more infrastructure development. And there, we need a competition. We need more funding from our development partners. When unfortunate times, they come with a lot of strings, and that becomes very difficult. Uh, Till today, our largest loan, we borrow maximum loan from World Bank and IMF and the ADB. But also we are trying to get some fund from other because the need for development process is too high. Now, is there any way out that I am, was pleased to hear from Senator Pine that his, she said that they have developed a big infrastructure budget. And is, are you willing to come up with more lucrative programs for countries like us for our infrastructure development. And we'll appreciate to have more infrastructure development financing. Thank you very much. I thought that question was for our Indian minister. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't he start out saying that was for you? <laughs> I, I think he thought you had more money. Um, we have just put in place, uh, finally, a 
a new head of a new entity called the Development Finance Corporation, which um, we hope is going to do a better job of um, being able to support projects around the world, particularly in countries, um, in developing countries. So um, I hope that's the case. Obviously, we also spend money on um, foreign assistance. Um, that, that often doesn't go for the same kind of economic development projects that I would like to see, and I think many of us would like to see, but hopefully that's what the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, will be able to do in a way that's more effective than it has been in the past. Uh, if I could, uh, uh, if I understood the question right, essentially what you're asking is, uh, there are competitive offers for development projects, why should countries not take advantage of it? I mean, if I could rephrase it in a way. Uh, you know, that, look, it's international relations is competitive. Every country will look for opportunities and see what it can do. But while doing so, it's in their own interest to be prudent about what they're getting into, to do the due diligence. We have seen now countries, including in our region, being saddled with uh, large debts. We have seen projects where, which are commercially unsustainable, airports where an aircraft doesn't come, harbors where a ship doesn't come. Uh, so uh, I think people would be justified in asking themselves, what am I getting into? Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, obviously in the interest of the con country concerned, but it's also in, in the interest of the international community because bad, you know, unsustainable projects don't end there. They then often the next is debt becomes equity and that becomes something else. So there are real concerns out there. So I think it's very important all of us make informed decisions, but of course very competitive decisions. If I can come back to your question and, uh, uh, you know, uh, my sense is, the, look, the Quad has agreed to do a vaccine project. Uh, I don't think the Quad necessarily has identical views uh, on all subjects, including on the TRIPS waiver. I think we have uh, a range of uh, uh, views on that. Uh, perhaps ours are the most, uh, in my view, progressive, but call it whatever. Uh, but the, the, uh, the point uh, I think which is troubling is, if you have a once in a century pandemic with such horrific consequences, and then say, but it has to be business as usual when it comes to producing vaccines. Ask yourself, are we doing the right thing? And this is not a one-off on vaccines. I mean, I would argue that is really what's happening on climate change as well. I mean, we get these homilies on how it's an existential issue, but when it comes down to actually putting resources or you know, uh, spreading technology in a sense for public good, we don't see that. So there are real issues. I think the global south has serious concerns. Uh, one of the deep worries for the international order is large parts of the world will be under or non-vaccinated. Uh, and this will be uh, 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 stretching out of a pandemic uh, possibly, which uh, need not have happened if we collectively had had uh, more effective policies. Thank you very much. Um, the lady in the third row. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Hi, good evening. Kelly Kraft, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. And I think that the, the uh, question about the global gateway was very important, especially with Senator Shaheen talking about our U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. And with the global gateway, isn't that an initiative where you bundle together particular industry or industry like institutions like what we have and the importance of being able to give a, 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 a sound narrative to the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think that's very important to be able to highlight that we can bundle these initiatives together when we have something that's transparent as in the global gateway as is the U.S. International Development Corporation. I think I certainly agree with that. I think it's a, a really important point. And one of the things that 
I think everybody up here has alluded to is that one of the important aspects, hopefully, of what we're doing in terms of development projects in, um, whether it's in the Quad, any of our countries in uh, Europe, in democracies, is there's transparency. So people know what they're getting. And that's really important. And to the question about shouldn't there be competition and so that countries can make the best choices, absolutely. But if you don't know what you're, you're buying, um, because there's no transparency, because you haven't, you don't know what the outcome of the deal is, then it's really hard to make the best choice. Um, we, we also have a question um, from our virtual audience. Uh, the question is, I think, directed to you, Minister Jayashankar. It says, uh, could you elaborate on uh, your G20 chair next year, navigating between developed and developing countries? Uh, well, we have, actually these are early days because uh, Indonesia is the G20 chair and uh, you, it, you know, this year is pretty much going to be their year. So we will be putting our cards uh, on the table at the end of the year uh, in terms of what our agenda and uh, what our theme, uh, what are the particular priorities that would, we would have. So it's not that I'm being cagey, it's just far too early to do that. But what I would add though is that, you know, we've been a very uh, strongly contributing member to the G20. And right now our priority is to make sure that the Indonesian chair of the G20 is completely successful. Uh, if we, do we have any more questions from the floor? If not, I'd like to ask uh, another question. Uh, we've talked a lot about, you know, partnerships uh, amongst, um, to, to, to seek to balance um, power in the region, etc. cetera. Um, but there is also a degree of internal balancing, uh, which is necessary, of course. And by this, I mean um, focusing on a country's own economic growth or own uh, military capabilities. I'd like to ask Minister Jayashankar, or perhaps any of you, how you think, um, how likely you think, or how easily you think your country will be able to emerge from this pandemic with strong economic growth, especially during a time of increased protectionism and deglobalization. Um, India in particular is not a member of the CPTPP or the RCEP, so um, tell us why you're optimistic. Uh I, I think we're a bit tight on time, so yeah. should I keep it very short? Of course. Uh, look, I think we'll, we have and we will come out of the crisis more competitive, and I'll just throw two numbers out there. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, we expect to post a 9.2, 9.3 growth rate this year, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is more than decent. Uh, and uh, secondly, our actually exports are at a record high. So it, it has shown that uh, despite not being a member of free trade arrangements, uh, the, the reforms we've done, the belt tightening we've done, the learnings of the COVID period have actually created a, a fairly resilient economy. Minister Payne, would you like to address this? Indeed, I think uh, Australia's uh, focus on ensuring that uh, we protected businesses and protected jobs, uh, particularly during the, uh, the pandemic, uh, which was a significant uh, investment on uh, the part of the Australian government, which it should have been, uh, has stood us in, uh, in very good stead. And our, our growth, our jobs numbers uh, reflect that, um, the, uh, the lowering of our unemployment rate uh, as well. We're not complacent. Uh, we know that, uh, that it is uh, still a difficult path ahead. But I would also note um, that on the question of, uh, of gender uh, workforce participation, for example, that uh, we see uh, a million more jobs held by women in the Australian economy than before the pandemic uh, in the most, uh, the most recent statistics, as well as being Australia's foreign minister, I'm also Australia's minister for women. Uh, and so I try in everything that I'm doing to, uh, to make sure that uh, both of my uh, portfolio responsibilities are, are come to the fore, uh, whether it is uh, in the sorts of discussions that we're having before around um, COVID response or more broadly. But I'm confident the Australian economy uh, is, uh, is in very good shape uh, relative to uh, the sorts of challenges that we've seen. Thank you. Um, perhaps Minister Hayashi next. 
How confident are you of Japan emerging um, uh, from the pandemic uh, with their strength, I suppose, to, to, uh, to balance uh, power in the region? Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, we've been in this pandemic for more two, two plus years and uh, find out that uh, uh, the sectors affected by the regulation not to move is uh, not the old economies, but if you divide the economy by big companies and small, medium, uh, manufacturing, non-manufacturing, then more heavier influence on those non-manufacturing, small and medium size, especially sightseeing, hotels, transportation, all those things. And actually, last fiscal year, ending last March, shows that the Japanese government revenue is the record high. Be not, maybe not because of the pandemic, because those sectors are not paying so many uh, corporate tax could be. So it's not a big macroeconomic effect that they are making. So we have to be precisely what was the effect to the economy. So rather than just macroeconomy itself, we have to focus on those areas and people of the, uh, working for those areas to, uh, uh, you know, or, or, uh, so those, those people, uh, so how to help them by u using the wise expenditure. So, and at the same time, after this, this time's COVID, uh, 19 is somehow we we can get along with them. Maybe the, not, we will return to the normal life before the COVID-19, I think, because like using uh, all those uh, kind of uh, virtual conference systems, living a little bit outside uh, out of the cities, building some nice wooden houses, and we are trying this to uh, you know, decentralize the Tokyo metropolitan areas. So uh, uh, maybe we have to see the, the, the economy after this pandemic is that something different and hopefully something better than this and not afraid too much of this uh, economic uh, impact to the macro economy as a whole, but maybe we have to focus on who are the most affected people. And Senator Shaheen, perhaps a slightly different twist to your question. Will the United States be so focused on building back better internally that it doesn't fulfill its um, potential uh, to be a driver of economic uh, growth in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I certainly hope not. You know, our economy has bounced back. Um, we've created a record number of jobs. It's growing uh, faster than anybody thought. And I think that's good not just for the United States, but it's good for uh, the Indo-Pacific. It's good for the world when economies are doing better. But supply chain issues still exist. Um, we still don't have enough of certain elements like semiconductors that we really need. And we have grown too dependent on manuf offshore manufacturing, so we've got to address that. But what I'm the most worried about is that despite all of, all of those economic indicators and what the data shows, people are still really depressed and frustrated. Um, and I think that that's not just particular to the United States, you were talking about that to some extent as well, because of this pandemic. And so it, it's not just about um, the economic factors. We've got to think about how we can make sure that people understand that this is going to end, that we are going to put resources towards things like mental health, which is a huge challenge for us, particularly among young people, and that we're going to come out of this better. Um, if, and again, this is another place where working together is going to help us do that. Thank you so much. I think Minister Hayashi earlier said that Japan was shy and didn't want to blow its own horn. Um, let not the modesty of those on this panel um, prevent us from giving them a huge round of applause for a very scintillating discussion.